mount that a dash a will read the etcfs tab file and mount the file systems listed in it or remount them if necessary and before doing so let's just confirm our etcfs tab entries we'll man our etcfs tab we may have placed an entry that should be in exports and that's correct so it should be defaults and for this option simply no root squash that's more like it as opposed to read only and read write a read only and read write is determined exclusively by the host server so in this case it's through an error for both or an error for no root squash and an error for defaults so we need to look into this to see why it doesn't like the syntax and that's because again these settings are dictated by the server so the client isn't taking it although older versions have so let's modify not a big deal one of the caveats when dealing with changes with Linux is that these little nuances happen to change so we'll just go with defaults because again the settings are the dictated by the server the NFS server we'll just set defaults save the changes and then execute mount dash a and now it looks nice now we have our mount points available, even after having unmounted them. Let's U-mount NFS1 again, and 2, and now they're no longer mounted. Then we'll clear screen and then execute mount-a, which causes the items to be remounted. So that's set. We have placed the items correctly into ETCFS tab, and the client will now remount the NFS mount points whenever the system is rebooted. Now as mentioned, there are several utilities included with the NFS packages. Another important one is the show mount utility. It allows you to display locally or remotely mounts that are available and are in action. For example, show mount the IP address 192.168.75.199 shows mounts on this system. Let's try this from the shell. We'll do a which show mount. It's in user s bin rpm query f user s bin show mount tells us it belongs to the NFS utilities program and a man show mount tells us that it queries the mount daemon on a remote host. The mount daemon is accessible to anyone who has network connectivity unless you're using IP tables or a filtration system like a firewall. So it lists NFS information about that remote system and let's give this a try. Show mount for 192.168.75.199 and this tells us that on 199 the host.10 which is the local system is mounted. Let's show mount for our local system and it tells us RPC is not registered. This is because the mount D daemon is not running. There's also show mount dash all, which shows the actual items that are mounted by the client. So show mount dash A shows mounts on the system. In other words, connected NFS clients. And show mount dash A shows the individual mounts that the client has made. Now, what if we try to mount forward slash NFS1 and or NFS2, forward slash that is, from a system that is that has a different IP address that isn't permitted, such as Linux CBT Media 1. So our sixth task will be to attempt to mount forward slash NFS1 and forward slash NFS2 from an unauthorized system. In this case, any system that doesn't match 192.168.75.10, such as Linux CBT Media 1. So from this system, df-h will tell us what's mounted. We see the Red Hat Enterprise 5.1 DVD ISO, but we see no traces of NFS. Mount grep NFS reveals nothing. Grep returns a non-zero status. So we'll make directory forward slash NFS 1, as well as forward slash NFS 2, and NFS1 already exists, so we'll make directory NFS2. Both exist, and this is from previous studies. So with that said, let's try to mount. We'll mount 
NFS 182.168.75.199, NFS 1 on NFS 1. Permission denied. How about 2 on 2? Permission is again denied. And that's because the ETC exports file on the host server doesn't permit the additional host. So with that said, if you want to permit additional hosts, modify your ETC exports file. Change a dot 10 to a subnet indicator, such as dot zero followed by the full number of bits, 255, 255, or use a slash, or specify the hosts independently. If you want to permit all hosts to mount, here's an easy way to do so. O slash 24 for both cases. Save the changes, then export FS A to update what's exported. So attempt to mount. It fails because client's IP does not match server's ETC, FS, or exports entry. So step two is update servers ETC exports to allow additional hosts, subnets, or subnet, etc. Which we've done. And then re-export to update the export table and then try again. So we've export FS-A. Let's return to Linux CBT Media 1 and try to mount NFS 1. Now it's successful. Let's try NFS 2 and it too will come back with an exit status of 0 which means if we execute DFH we'll see in addition to the ISO image the two NFS items. Mount will show similarly. And also, if we LSLTR NFS1, we'll see any entries that have been created. Ditto for NFS2. Again, the volume is still in read-only mode. So if we try to write to NFS2 from either host, again, looking at our graphic, we're sharing from the VMware instance two NFS mount points, forward slash NFS1 and forward slash NFS2. We've mounted those two exports from one Red Hat Enterprise box and another all-purpose SUSE Enterprise box. So both have access. Let's try to sequence 1 million NFS2. We'll call this test from Linux CBT Media 1.txt, which will of course fail because it's a read-only file system. How about trying to do so from NFS1? or into NFS1, and notice it works, because root squash has been turned off. So, so long as we mount the export as root, and you are logged on to the client as root, you'll be able to write to the NFS export as root. So, from either host, let's try from this one, we will be able to see the new file. And there it is. Test from Linux CBT Media 1. We can interrogate it to confirm that it isn't a blank file, and it was actually written from, again, the additional client. We can append to it from our local system. So let's grow the file. We'll sequence 1000 using append redirection into tests from Linux CBT Media 1. The exit status is clean, and now when we tail the contents of the file, we'll see that it contains new items which lead up to a thousand as opposed to up to a million. And from the Media 1 box, we can do likewise. Let's navigate into NFS1 and tell the contents of media onetxt where you'll see the items leading up to a thousand, which we appended from the remote system, Serve one So then with, after all of this, what is the purpose of the read-only export? Well, just that. If there is content, such as an application or a set of PDFs or documents that should not be modified that you'd like to publish to your user community in a read-only state using NFS, then that's the perfect usage. For example, let's navigate to NFS2, but we need to do so on the export system, the server that's responsible for exporting, of course, NFS2. And we'll sequence 1 million 
a file, we'll call it security policy dot pdf, a file that should not be updated. It really is a text file. It will create an NFS2 and immediately after confirming the exit status, when we navigate to remote systems, you'll see that the file is available. We can use the file immediately. The permissions are set for root because no root squash is enabled. And from another remote system, again, the file is available. So it's a great way to publish items. You won't be able to change it. If you sequence 1000, for example, using a pen redirection to the file, it doesn't allow you to change it, but you can at least read it. So it's a great way to publish information to remote clients using read-only NFS exports. So again, NFS is straightforward. You just set up what you'd like to export, and you do so using ETC exports, and you use export FS, the command, to query as well as to refresh the local mount daemon. You also use show mount to see what's mounted. Now we have multiple users mounted. So if we use show mount dash A, 192.168.75.199, you'll see that two systems have mounted two mounts, or two exports. Media 1, Linux CVT Serve 1. So there are facilities. And we should also just note that NFS makes use of RPC remote procedure calls, which makes use of dynamic port assignments. So when setting up NFS in your corporate environment, in particular across layered or hierarchical environments such as VLANs, DMZs, and so on, be mindful of this fact, as it may prohibit your users who have NFS client software from connecting to the NFS server. So just be mindful of that to be sure that your firewall or switch with access lists or router passes the remote procedure call ports, which you can lock into a port range or just permit it flexibly so that the client and server can communicate using RPC. Now next, we'll look at AutoFS, which is an RHCE requirement that you be able to set up the AutoFS feature set.